Last week, uh, we were closed. For those, uh, hopefully you all got the memo. If you missed it, I did still actually preach last week. I uploaded, I preached from my bedroom, actually. The only space that had a white wall. Yeah, okay, Judy saw it. If you have not watched it, we actually continued in Ephesians, and I preached on Ephesians 5, verse 3, all the way through verse 20. So if you missed that, it is online on the church YouTube page. So you go to youtube.com and you search Trowbridge Community Church. You can see all the past sermons that I've preached. Uh, guest sermons are there, including last week's. It'll be the only one that's a normal video instead of the audio that the rest of them are. But if you want to catch up on that or hear what I had to say, jump into that. I just wanted to give you a heads up about that since some of you might have missed it. And I'll be referencing. I'll do my best to fill in what I'm referencing today as we go through. Uh, so if you weren't able to watch it, you won't be lost. The other thing I want to say before we get started today is today's text is not a fun one to preach. In fact, many preachers avoid this one. It's a loaded text. Our culture has so much emotional investment in what God has to say about marriage, about the roles between genders, about how we relate to one another, that I ask for your grace, patience. I'm going to do my best to not load the emotional baggage, but to unpack the richness and beauty that Paul wanted to tackle in his day and what that can mean for us now. So if you are someone who has a lot of emotional investment in this passage, I get it. I'm there too. I ask for grace and I ask you with me to learn and listen with an open mind as if you've perhaps never read this text before. And I'm hoping that I can open some things up in a way that you've never heard. Now your bulletins will tell you I'm only preaching through the end of chapter 5. I am going to tackle the first part of 6. They are inextricably linked, but the focus of my message today is going to be on uh, the end of chapter 5, the husband and wife passage. We will talk about kids, we'll talk about the slave master thing, but the focus is this first part. So I'm going to read the text. Uh, We'll read all of it, all through 6. So we'll be starting in Ephesians chapter 5, starting in verse 21. I'll give you a moment if you would like to flip there. Looks like most of you are already there. Um, All right. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands as you do to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife as Christ is the head of the church, his body of which he is the Savior. Now, as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit to their husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word, and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. In the same way, husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. After all, no one ever hated their own body, but they fed and care, they feed and care for their body, just as Christ does the church. For we are members of his body. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. This is a profound mystery, but I am talking about Christ and the church. However, each of you also must love his wife as he loves himself, and the wife must respect her husband. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with a promise, so that it may go well with you and that you may enjoy living, enjoy long life on the earth. Fathers, do not exasperate your children. Instead, bring them up in training and instruction of the Lord. Slaves, obey your earthly masters with respect and fear and sincerity of heart, just as you would obey Christ. Obey them not only to win their favor, when, they are, when their eye is on you, but as slaves of Christ, doing the will of God from your heart, serve wholeheartedly as if you were serving the Lord, not people, because you know that the Lord will reward each one for whatever good they do, whether they are a slave or free. Masters, treat your slaves in the same way. Do not threaten them, since you know that he who is both master, is, is both their master and yours is in heaven, and there is no favoritism with All right, so this text 
at face value seems to be clear, cut, and dry. We read it, we go, oh, okay, this makes sense. We move on. We either like what it says or we don't. And like I said, there's a lot of emotional baggage, and I'm hoping to unpack that. But there's actually something really interesting going on that I'm really hoping to draw out of you, and I don't know if you heard it as I read through it, but this text is an analogy. It's an analogy. Analogies are probably some of my favorite way of expressing myself. I love analogies. Analogies, uh, just to make sure we're on the same page, is, t- is describing an event, an object, or a, a process by using something similar to it that the hearer might understand. So if I got up here and wanted to start talking to you about a board game that I really like, most of you would be lost. You wouldn't know what I'm talking about. A lot of language and pieces that we talk about when we talk about board games or card games or any games that we might play are lost on people who aren't in that world, who don't play these games. And so we might need to use an analogy, something that we can replace key words and phrases that have meaning to those who understand them but lose their meaning outside of it. It's one of the interesting things when we think about apologetics, for instance. There are a lot of key words Christians use all the time that we never think to translate outside of the church. We say, how, we might ask someone, how's your walk with the Lord? How is God loving you today? Is God sitting on the throne of your heart? It's even, even some words like sin and son of God can lose their meaning even on people in the church. I was at a youth pastor conference a couple of years ago. And we had an illusionist come up. He did a bunch of tricks. It was really cool. But then he did something that was fascinating. And you can agree or disagree with the method. But what he was attempting to capture was perfect. What he did is he told the story of Scripture through the lens of superheroes rather than through what we would traditionally want to tell it using Scripture as the only base. Now, there's nothing wrong necessarily with either method. The difficulty in analogizing scripture is we need to be careful that the analogy works. But what he, dis- what he revealed to us is he said, I, I did this. I did this superhero spiel at a church. It's a really big church. And I had people come up to me afterwards. And they said, I had no idea that Jesus was God's son and also God. Because we had, they had used in that church the language of the Son of God, the Savior, the Messiah, but had never taken the time to unpack what do these terms mean. One of the other analogies that always falls apart, that's always really interesting, is when we try to create an analogy for the Trinity. Because none of them work. None of them. It's very unfortunate. It's the most confusing doctrine that we know is true, and we cannot create an analogy for it. A lot of us like to think of like, we take like a, a, a man, we say, well, he's a father, a husband, and, a, and a, war, a worker, a boss. But that doesn't work because that's suggesting a, a type of heresy called modalism. God is not then three persons existing in one. He's one person shifting through three different forms in that analogy as an example. But Paul in this text, to kind of bring it back to Ephesians, is using an analogy of husbands and wives, of children, of families, of slaves, to talk about Christ and his love for the church and how the church is to respond to Christ. This is a continuation of what Paul has been talking about now for a while. Walk worthily as children of God. So in chapter 5, verse 1 of Ephesians, Follow God's example, therefore, as dearly loved children, and walk in the way of love just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. Walk worthily. Walk in a manner worthy of the love of Christ. Remember Ephesians 4.1, the pivot in this whole section. Therefore, I urge you, live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Another way that we could translate it is walk. Walk worthily of the calling that you have received. Paul, in this whole section since chapter 4, has been talking about how our response to Christ should shape the way we live. And now Paul is using two more analogies. So he's using this one, and then the next week we're going to be in the armor of God section. A really famous, everyone knows that one. 
That one's an exciting sermon. This one is less so. We'll be honest. But the analogy, this text is actually not primarily about husbands and wives or fathers and children or slaves and masters. That is an analogy where Paul actually wants to talk about Christ and what Jesus has done for his church and how the church should respond. And because that's really difficult to talk about, Paul is actually using a common framework that the ancient world used called household codes to express this. So before we get into the text proper, I need to unpack some of this historical information first. First things first, in the ancient world, Rome wanted Pax Romana. I've talked about this a couple of times. This is the idea of the peace of Rome, that Rome guarded violently. If you were a troublemaker in Rome, you were not asked nicely to be stopped. You were not told to knock it off. You were probably just executed, thrown in prison, enslaved, whatever. You were stripped of your rights if you caused a problem for Rome. Do not break Pax Romana. Do not break the peace of Rome. But because you can't create a society-wide rule that everyone can easily grasp onto, you boil down the rules to a, a, a unit that you can easily address, that everyone fits into and can understand. And in this case, they talked about the household, household codes. And in that day, the, the how people were addressed is vastly different from how Paul chooses to address people. Paul is actually being incredibly countercultural to that day. He's flipping the entire process on its head, which oftentimes I think many people who want to go to this passage and they don't like what it says, they want to assume that Paul was actually embracing the culture of his day and following with the teachings. He wasn't at all. Paul was actually flipping the whole thing over, and I'll explain how. First of all, uh, as we get into this text, you'll see a couple things. First of all, wives are addressed at all, and they're addressed first. This is huge. Women were not addressed unless you were one of the wealthier women who, ha were, who had power and control in your family. You most likely, as a woman, didn't in that day. And so oftentimes, these household codes in ancient Rome would look at the husband and say, your wife should obey you. you should, they should do what you say. You should be the person. Keep your house in order. Everyone, so the wife is not really your property, but she doesn't really have full humanity. She's not fully autonomous. She doesn't have full personhood. So you got to tell her what to do. This is ancient codes. Just reminder. Children were basically your property. They were your honor, your, your joy. The thing that was going to pass on your name, your legacy, and your honor to the rest of the world. Children were effectively your property. Not quite your property, but not slave property, but they were there. Children's role was to be obedient to parents, more of a be seen but not heard kind of a mentality, and that was their job. And slaves, of course, were slaves. They were your actual property. Now, I'll remind you again when we get to the slaves part, but slaves then is not how we think of slaves from the Civil War era. Our slavery was racially motivated and our slaves were treated horribly. And they were never expected to get freedom. They were going to work until they died. And that was their life. They were never going to be free. In the ancient Roman world, it was actually fully expected. If you were a slave, you were likely to earn your freedom in your own lifetime. In fact, you might even go on to become a business owner, own your own property become a really good uh, co-worker in a business venture with your former master, where you two would work together as partners. In fact, in Philemon, Paul is writing to a slave owner on behalf of a slave saying, take him back in, work with him, and if you're willing, give him his freedom because he would be a great asset for you in helping you with what you need to take care of. Welcome him back in with love and honor and respect. Slaves were not racially motivated at all in the ancient world. If you were a person who had no money, if you were in debt, sometimes you would be sold as a slave to pay the debt off. You would basically work for someone, probably work for the person you owed the debt to until the debt was paid off, and then you would be released. That's it. That's all there is to it. So slavery was a almost, we almost want to think of endangered servanthood. What we think of today uh, as slaves. In fact, oftentimes some of our English translations will translate the word slave as bond servant or bonded servant. 
it, it's not a great translation when you see that in your English text. It's not wrong, but the word slave is still closer. And if you are a slave, you are still owned by your master. You do lack freedom. But Paul has specific instructions for slaves that we will see. And so as we think about this historical context, it's important to keep this in mind. Women, children, slaves, they were never addressed. Paul addresses all three of them. And first, before he addresses men in each section. Second, wives are addressed, like I just said, first, before their husbands, which is huge. Paul is actually giving women, children, and slaves honor, credit, and autonomy, personhood. Paul is talking to them directly, saying, you have a choice here to make. You have responsibility to respond well in these situations. Not, you are not property. You are not basically property. You're not lacking personhood. Paul's giving them personhood. And we'll talk about some of those other texts that are important to remember. Now, the last thing I want to address is actually verse 21 in Ephesians chapter 5. Verse 21 is a very interesting text. Now, the thing that we've been dancing around is a conversation surrounding whether marriages are meant to be built as complementarian. Husbands and wives have complementary but different roles to fill. Typically, complementarian believers will argue that husbands are at least the spiritual leader. They're supposed to guide the household spiritually. And the opposite side of this is egalitarianism, where the egalitarians believe that there are no real distinctions between husbands and wives. There can be 100% equality between the two, and they can live in peace that way. And their marriage can work and flourish and grow and thrive in Christ. I'm going to work through the text, and I'm going to unpack what I think it's saying. If you believe differently than I do, I'm going to leave that between you and God. Work out your faith with fear and trembling. My responsibility is primarily to unpack the text as faithfully as I can. And that is my goal today, my goal every Sunday. And so again, I ask for patience if I unpack something that you disagree with. But verse 21 is an interesting text because the egalitarians and the complementarians disagree about where it goes. See, many of our Bibles have verse headings. In fact, mine has a verse heading in it, a little like section heading that is a brief summary of what you're about to read. Mine says instructions for Christian households. That's at the top. Um, some of you might say something similar. Where verse 21 goes depends on the translation of the Bible that you have, how old it is, what the goal was. The disagreement is whether or not verse 21 goes with the previous section where Paul, starting in verse 15, is talking about living as wise, not unwise, making the most of every opportunity, singing songs of praise, hymns, and worship to one another, encouraging one another, building one another up. In fact, before that, in, uh, starting in verse 8 going down, Paul actually encouraged us to call out sin in one another, love one another so deeply that when we see someone err, we will look at them and say, that's not right. And because I love you, I want to call you out, not in a harsh way, but in a way that encourages you to make better choices. And then you get to verse 21, submit out to one another out of reverence for Christ. Well, verse 21 seems like it could go really well with the previous section. But verse 21 can also go really well with what's following. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands. And so the disagreement is where this verse goes. The verse goes with both of them. It has implications for both of them. It informs both sections. It goes with both. In fact, in the original text, if you had an original Greek Bible, they would have been all capital Greek letters smashed together with no paragraphs, no indentation, no headings, no verses, no punctuation, nothing. It's one of the challenges of translating the ancient text when we find manuscripts to English as we first have to decide, where's the paragraph? Where do the periods go? Where's the end of Paul's thought in this section? And does it relate to the next? Letters were meant to be read in one sitting which is something I've always wanted to do, but is not practical for a Sunday morning. And so the question, if you ever hear someone ask or talk about where does verse 21 go in Ephesians 5, the answer is it goes with both. It informs both, and it is important to read verse 21 with both. Now, if you listen to the sermon I did last week, I skipped verse 21. I didn't read it. I left it off. And I did that because I wanted to address it this week with this text 
more specifically and spend more time on it. But if you listen to last week's sermon and you hear everything I say, and at the end of it, you think, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ, perfect. That is what Paul intended. That is what Paul wanted. But let's jump into the text now and let's unpack this analogy that Paul created for Christ and his church. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. This is verse 21. Wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands as you do to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church, his body, of which he is the Savior. Now, as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit to, the, in, to their husbands in everything. So the word submit is a dirty word nowadays. We don't like it. We have a lot of language, loaded terms that go with this word submit. Feminism did a lot of things in our culture, whether you like it or not, it did a lot of things. I would argue at least some of them good. And we can disagree or agree from there. But the word submit is one of the things that has just changed. Uh, much like many symbols or icons over the years have changed their meaning and embraced new definitions based on how culture just changes, submit is one of them. When we hear the word submit, we actually run into slavery. And we think of submit. You have to be obedient. You have no voice. You have no say. You have no word or anything like that. But here's the thing. If you're to flip a page or go down to the next section, whatever it is for you, uh, to the beginning of chapter 6, verse 1, Paul says, children, obey your parents. But here in chapter 5, verse 22, wives, submit to your husbands. They are actually different words in Greek. And in Greek, the word submit is not a dirty word. Rather, what Paul is saying is willingly submit to your husband's leadership. L willingly listen to what your husband has to say. For the husband is the head of the wife as Christ is the head of the church, his body of which he is the savior. Here's the analogy. Christ, the savior of the church, leads the church. And the church's responsibility, our collective responsibility, is to willingly submit to Christ, to willingly listen to his leading and his guiding, to willingly listen to what he has to say. To be obedient and respond well is a role that Christians have to God, to Christ. But in this section, the word submit that Paul is really trying to capture for the church to Christ is a willing, yes, God, because I love you because of all the things that you've done for me, because of Ephesians chapter one through three, the blessing that he's poured on us, how he has saved us, how he's redeeming a new humanity, bringing apart two completely disparate groups that would never get along together, bringing them together in one new humanity that Christ is leading his church with love and grace and tenderness. Yes, I will obey you. I will submit to you willingly and lovingly. That is the analogy in this paragraph. As for wives submitting to their husbands, there is a lot of conversation about what headship means for husbands. The husband is the head of the wife as Christ is the head of the church. There are a lot of people who want to look at the word head and they want to actually think source. They want to argue that what Paul is saying is not necessarily leadership, but rather origination. The church originates from Christ. Christ is the creator of the church. Adam is the originating source for Eve when God pulled the rib out of Adam and created Eve. This is an argument that many people make uh, for if they wanted to go the egalitarian route. I'm not persuaded personally. However, as I've said, and as I'll say again, this is a passage in which the best thing to do is for us, if we disagree, to listen to one another, encourage one another, pray for one another and not think someone is horribly wrong or a terrible Christian if they disagree with our interpretation. This is a loaded text. I'm not persuaded by the source argument here. The Paul has used in Ephesians alone a, the body of Christ imagery. And whenever he has, he's never meant source. He's always meant that Christ is the head, the, the leading force, the guiding principle for the church. And the church should listen and follow Christ's leadership as his body. And that seems to be a similar argument that Paul is making here. But 
Wives, your instruction is this big. It's really small. Husbands get two-thirds of the instructions and most of the analogy. So we're going to jump into that now. Verse 25, husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by washing with water through the word and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. In this way, husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. After all, no one ever hated their own body, but they feed and care for their body just as Christ does the church. For we are members of his body. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This is a profound mystery, but I'm talking about Christ and the church. However, each, of, each one of you must also love his wife as he loves himself, and the wife must respect her husband. I want to start with the analogy first, the Christology, the, the Christ-centered nature of this paragraph first. First, in... Uh, the second half of verse 25, just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by washing with water through the word. So the first thing that we see is that Christ's love for the church is so strong that he sacrificed his life. He gave up everything, his honor, his dignity, his justice, his right to live on the right hand of God on the throne to be held as the name of all names, which we read about in Ephesians chapter one. All these blessings that Christ gets to give to us, he gives to us as a result of this right here, that Christ gave himself up for her, the church, to make her holy, cleansing her by washing her with water through the word, through his revelation, through the New Testament and the Old Testament, through the gospel books, through the revelation that God reveals to our hearts when we engage with his text. We are being washed with water to be made pure and holy as the church. All of us together, the bride of Christ. This imagery that, that Paul is putting forward here, that uh, to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. Christ's work for the church is first and foremost to purify it, to cleanse it, to sanctify it. One of the difficult things to think about when we read the scriptures is we often want to think in terms of individuality. We live in America, post-enlightenment. One of the things that came out of the enlightenment and in, in modern and modernity, the, the thinking that goes with it is individualism. Right? I am Michael Hall. I am separate from all of you. I am responsible for myself. I'm not responsible for the decisions you make. However, that is not how Paul or God or any of scripture thinks because individualism is a foreign concept to the ancient world. Think about this way, and I've, I've mentioned this. All sin is sin committed against another person. You can never sin against yourself. You're always sinning against God for sure, but every sin, every action that Paul calls us to do as Christians or to put to death because we are Christians and no longer Gentiles or living of the world are actions that involve another party. Put away malice and rage and gossip. Bring on humility. Seek unity above all else, gentleness, patience. These are all things that require another party to be involved. Biblically speaking, Every time you see the word you, it is almost always a plural you in the Greek, which we might say y'all if we're from Texas, which one of my good friends is. So I see y'all all the time. Whenever you read a you, it is most, almost always plural. Paul's not talking to the individual reading the text. He's talking to the church. This is the church of Ephesus. Not individuals in the church of Ephesus. No, the church of Ephesus is going to be washed by Christ. The sacrifice that Christ made is going to bring about a beauty of the church of Ephesus, a blamelessness, a staying free church that Christ can then present to himself as a bride and say, I redeemed you, church of Ephesus. Now, we have brought in modern world individualism into it. So individually, we are being brought, Michael Hall, 
all of you are being brought individually redeemed to Christ. But when you read scripture, it is always important to have in the back of your mind as you read it, as you think about the personal responsibility that I have to take, it is always important to keep in the back of your mind the church-wide thought that Paul always had in mind, that Jesus always had in mind. He was always thinking in terms of the assembly. In fact, ekklesia, the Greek word for church, actually means assembly. Its primary definition is the gathering or the assembly. In fact, Israel was thought of as an assembly in the Old Testament as well. The gathering people who believe in God, who get together, that is who Jesus wants to redeem. Obviously, individuals are redeemed in that. Our modern thought conflicts a little bit with how the Bible thinks, but it's important to remember this. We, as a church, are meant to live life together, supporting one another, loving one another, praying for one another, calling out sin in one another, as, we, uh, as I preached about last week online, and also to sing songs of praise and hymns and live with one another. Do not drink wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit, which just happens earlier in uh, chapter 5. Christ wants to present this to him, the church to himself, all of us as a group to Christ. So verse 28 picks up the, the husbands, the analogy, right? Husbands and wives is the analogy for Christ and the church. In the same way, husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. After all, no one ever hated their own body, but they feed and care for their body just as Christ does the church. Christ feeds and cares for his body, the church. For we are members of his body, verse 30. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. This is a profound mystery, but I'm talking about Christ and the church. I want to pause there. The last two weeks, we have been talking about putting to death the Gentile way of living and putting on new spiritual life and identity which looks like getting rid of a set of behaviors and including a new set of behaviors because of who we are. This is what it led to. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife and the two shall become one flesh. Who is our father? All the way back in Ephesians chapter two, the father of the sons of disobedience, the spirit who is not working the sons of disobedience, Satan, evil, sin, death, that is our original father. And mother. The thing that birthed us into the world, evil. Not really, but if we're thinking in terms of the analogy, we have to break away from our former way of life, our former father, and cleave to be united with our new husband, Christ, as the church. This is an analogy. Paul is taking a direct quote from Genesis and transforming it to encompass everything that he's just been talking about in previous sections of chapter five and saying, this former way of life was your father. It was your former family. You don't belong to them anymore. You leave them and you become united with your spouse. This is a profound mystery, but I'm talking about Christ in the church. However, Paul wants to revert back to the analogy because like household codes, Paul can't necessarily just explain this. We gotta have an analogy, something that people can hold on to. Husbands and wife, children, families are how we can hold on to this. Each one of you must also love his wife as he loves himself, and the wife must respect her husband. So a couple things about husbands before we move on to the kids. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church. Historically, I think many of us read that first paragraph. Wives, submit to your husbands. To your own husbands, did you do to the Lord? For the husband is the head of the wife as Christ is the head of the church. And we put a period there where there's a comma. And we go, all right, cool. Husbands are in charge. That's the way it is. Historically, that is how many Christians have read it. However, it's not a period, it's a comma. Verse 25, husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church. I don't know the last time you uh, read it, last time I read it, Christ died for the church. He gave everything up for the church. And so in the analogy, husbands, give up everything for your wives. Everything. Lay your life down for them. Submit your needs and your desires. Put them down and look to hers 
first and foremost. It is our job as husbands to ensure that our wives are happy, they're thriving, they are getting their needs met, they are being taken care of, their ideas are being heard, that their personhood, that Paul took the time to give to women in that day is being cared for. Right? And within this analogy, Paul is reminding the husbands over and over again, love your wives as Christ loved the church, as you love your own body. This is the way that you are to live with your spouse. Now, I'm a husband. So I'm a lot more, as you can tell, I'm a lot more passionate about this section. Always been fired up about this one. Love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. And so there's a lot that can be said about husbands and wives. Wives are not called to obey, but to willingly submit. Husbands are called to willingly submit. That to lead their wife looks like submitting to them, giving things up for them, leading them through service, leading them through care and concern and compassion. Remember, Ephesians 21 goes with both sections. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Out of reverence for Christ, husbands, submit to your wives. Love them completely. Lead them through your submission. Show them the love of Christ every day by how you love them. And wives, the same thing back to your husbands. Submit to them. Respect them as Paul ends. That, that your job as wives is to love your husband completely. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. And whether you want to believe the egalitarian marriage policy of we're completely equal. If we take Galatians 3.25, there's no Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female, for all are one in Christ. I think that's fine. I don't know that this text teaches that, but there are good arguments to be had here. And if you believe the complementarian marriage style, husbands are to be the spiritual head of the household, to love their wives and to cherish them and lead them through submission. That's, I think both are fine. Work out your faith with fear and trembling before the Lord. God calls us to do that. And together, we will work out our faith with fear and trembling as a church, as a body of Christ, encouraging one another, living with one another, loving with one another, listening to with one another, and helping each other see new ways that we can love and cherish one another. Because again, this analogy, the household code for the ancient world was to order society. This household code that Paul gives both explains a deep mystery about Christ and the church, but also how the church is to be ordered. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Listen to one another and love one another. Starting in verse six, this last section will go pretty quick. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with a promise, so that it may go well with you and that you may enjoy long life on the earth. There's not a lot of kids in here, but there's a couple. But all of us are kids of some parents, whether we can still talk to them or not. Uh, I hope we all listen to them. I didn't always. Kids can be frustrating sometimes. I am now finding this out as a parent of a two and a half month old. And he doesn't even have the capacity for manipulation yet. He's already driving me nuts. Children, obey your parents. This is right in the Lord. However, it continues on. Father, do fathers, do not exasperate your children. Instead, Bring them up in training and instruction to the Lord. This is key. And what does it mean to exasperate your children or frustrate your children or don't make them angry or wrathful towards you? Think about what you, how you talk to them. The words that you use matter. How do you engage with your kids? How do you discipline them when they do wrong? How do you bring them up to know Jesus? I would say submit to one another out of fear, out of reverence for Christ applies here too. Lead your kids by submitting to them, serving them, loving them through that process. You're still the parent. They don't get to be in charge of you through the submission, but they can learn a lot through it. Humility, graciousness, patience are just some of the things. We should be careful as fathers, as parents, um, even mothers when they teach, to think about the words that we use and how we talk to kids. Nothing makes me angry than hearing a parent call their child a monster and not using a hint of irony or jokingness is a terrible word to use and it has too many negative implications. We should be careful how we talk to our kids because they matter and they are going to eventually take care of us when we're old. So we should be nice to them now. 
And for the parents whose kids stray, which happens far too often, continue to love them and care for them and pray for them, reaching out to them and caring for them when you can and when they give you opportunities to. So many of us know people who've walked away from the faith, whose parents now mourn that loss. I know them from my previous church who still try to build a relationship with them. And the relationship is so in tatters that they can barely even talk to their kids. And it's heartbreaking. But all we can do in those moments is give it to God. Pray that Jesus will make a difference in their lives and then be available for them whenever they can. Slaves, starting in verse five of chapter six, obey your earthly masters with respect and fear and with sincerity of heart, just as you would obey Christ. Obey them not only to win their favor when their eye is on you, but as slaves of Christ doing the will of God from your heart. Serve wholeheartedly as if you were serving the Lord, not people, because you know that the Lord will will reward each one of you for whatever good they do, whether they are slave or free. And masters, treat your slaves in the same way. Do not threaten them since you know what that he who is both their master and yours is in heaven. And there is no favoritism with him. Now, this is an interesting text. I don't know about you. I don't have slaves in my household. Just saying. Oftentimes when we get to this text, we want to we wanna take the analogy another step because we don't have slaves. How do we think about this? And we want to take it to bosses and coworkers. And that's a great analogy. It's fantastic. But here's the problem. In the ancient world, a household would often include slaves. Again, more like bond servants, but still technically slaves, that lived in the household that did menial tasks, that took care of kids, that took care of business opportunities and ventures that the owner wanted to have done. And so how do we analogize this? Well, it's really hard. But the best thing I can think of is if imagine if you had a nanny, or even the show Nanny with Fran. It's a great show. I loved that when I was a kid. She lived in that household, raising those kids and taking care of them. That is effectively the best analogy going forward as a modern day slave. Fran was not a slave in that show. She was being paid for her work and she lived in the household as amongst the family. And so if that family read this text, they would be able to go, oh, okay. So I don't own Fran. I don't own the nanny. But that's a great analogy to think of how do I treat the people I pay for, the the servants that I pay to do things for me. When you invite people to your home to fix plumbing or to do electrical work, they're not slaves, but they are serving you and taking care of a task on your behalf. Treat them well, care for them in that moment. That is the best way I think to analogize this and keep this in the terms of households. If you were to change this last section to bosses and workers and employees, you would also probably have to change the rest of it to bosses and entry-level employees as the children, and then bosses and maybe the board or something. Something that would keep the analogy of a consistent, how, a consistent single unit that has different levels, that Christ that you can then analogize to the church. So I think the best way to think of is in terms of a nanny or a babysitter or someone that comes and takes care of uh, household chores on a regular basis. How you treat them matters. Even when you go out with your family to restaurants or fast food places, or as I talked about a couple weeks ago, when a service person calls you on the phone, how you treat them should reflect this passage. Treat them as if they belonged in your house. How would you treat someone who lived with you on a regular basis but was not immediate family, but took care of things for you? God does not see favoritism, which is the key word there. God does not look at masters more favorably than slaves or vice versa. They are all his children, and he wants to see them all flourish and thrive, even if that is through struggling and suffering. Paul does not call on masters to release their slaves. He calls on masters to treat their slaves well. So God, Paul has to emphasize, does not show favoritism. Slaves are not down on their luck people who God shows more favorably to, and the masters are evil jerks. God does not show more favoritism to the masters who've done it right and have kept their money and managed their finances well versus the slaves who potentially were in debt and had to sell themselves to pay it off. Both require to love and listen to one another and care for one another as if they were blood relatives in the same household. 
And so the way I want to end this today, the sermon, we ran a little bit longer than I planned, but that's okay, is that we are meant to submit to one another. And I, I mentioned this before, but even through this last section, children and fathers, slaves and masters, the language of submission, serving one another, caring for one another with kind words and gentleness is through this whole text. And so when we think of the church, Trowbridge Community Church here in Otsego, Michigan, or playing well, or however, I think we're technically at Sego. However it breaks down, this church right here in this moment, this is the bride of Christ, the wife in this analogy, to submit faithfully to Christ, willingly to Christ, as Paul has been talking about all through chapter five, all through chapter four of Ephesians. Submit to Christ by the fear and reverence. Live a life worthy of the calling you received. Walk worthily, walk in a manner fitting of being a child of God. Let's listen to one another and encourage one another. Let's pray for one another. And I want to leave you with this. This whole section hinges on a verse in the previous section. Verse 18 of chapter 5. Do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. In the original Greek, verse 21 does not have a, fin a, fi a finitive verb, a, a finite verb, so a, a standard verb. It's a participle. So submitting to one another out of Christ. And in Greek, you always have to look for a key verb, the main verb. The main verb is to be filled with the Spirit. Everything that we do in households, in the church, in loving one another, is to be done out of being filled with the Holy Spirit to sing songs to one another, to submit to one another, to love one another, and to cherish and respond well to the work Christ is doing to prepare us, his church, his bride, to present to himself. And so everything that we do needs to be led out of that, to listen, to encourage. When we see sin in one another, we should call it out with gentleness, patience, and truth. Always show humility, seek unity above all else, and in everything that we do for the church and for each other here, we should be seeking for the betterment of the church, not the betterment of ourselves. And through seeking the betterment of the church, we will find betterment in ourselves. We will ourselves grow in Christ. And so as it comes to the analogy on marriage, submit to one another, love one another completely. That is our calling. No matter who you are, no matter how you want to read this passage, Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Love one another completely. And it will go well in your household and in the church. Let's pray. God, I want to thank you so much for your word, for the challenging text that we engaged with today, and the beauty of seeing Christ through the whole thing. Lord, I pray that you would impress upon our hearts what we are meant to have learned today, that we would listen to your voice first. We would put aside our own wants and desires and seek first your kingdom and your glory. Everything else, Lord, we'll figure out. I pray that you would encourage us to love one another, encourage one another, challenge one another. And I pray that you would keep us safe as we head out of here this week. Keep us safe as we engage with your word, even with texts we don't want to read. And Lord, love us completely and fully and let that change our lives. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen.